se escucha por And the that was done about it. Vaya más cerca. cerca sí. And then I'm going to take us back in time, sort of, and walk through the history of life up until this time, and talk about the significance and the types of animals. And what's going on here at this time? So, the fossils were discovered when the people came out to work on the railway. It was 1870s, and a deal was made between the government of Canada and the colonies out on the West Coast that British Columbia would join Confederation in exchange for a railway. So they were building the Canadian Pacific Railway, the Transcontinental Railway. And this part here, through field, down to the curve, and up to the spiral tunnels, was the hardest part to do because it was the steepest grade on the whole train tracks. People that came out here were surveyors and geologists, railway workers. And it wasn't long before they started to find these stone bugs down in the valley, way down there. It was the field assistant of one of the geologists, R.G. McConnell, who understood how gravity works and climbed all the way up the mountain to find the place we're looking at today. Almost immediately it was made Canada's second national park and at the time it just included Emerald Lake Valley and the Mount Stephen trilobite beds. The geologist, Mr. Dr. Connell, would write a paper about these trilobites. This is what a trilobite looks like. It's this not a trilobite, it's a plastic toy made in China. But it's a special toy, uh, it's like a science toy because it's color coded, it's life size, and it is the same species as my favorite little guy over yeah. here. Beautiful. McConnell wrote a paper in a scientific journal and it was published and eventually found its way to the desk of a guy called Charles Walcott. Now, Dr. Walcott's a pretty interesting guy. In addition to being a politician and the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, he was the world's leading expert in Cambrian paleontology. Now, Cambrian, like Devonian, Ordovician, Silurian, Cretaceous, is a time period. The Cambrian extends from about 545 to about 495 million years ago. I used to go through this exercise at this point where I try and explain what half a billion years is. I don't get it. I've been doing this literally all my life. I, none of us could possibly understand how big an amount of time that is. The magnitude of the time is just so beyond human scale. But at the time that Walcott reads the paper, it's believed that life on Earth begins at the beginning of the Cambrian. And like Andres said, Walcott had no idea how old that was. In Walcott's time, as it is today to some extent, it's more important that we know the order in which things happen than the actual age, right? So it's more important from a paleontologist's point of view to know that Santiago is older than Jordan, and I'm sorry, but you told me this information. Rosie is older than Andres, is that right? Yes. <laughs> 43. <laughs> Rather than having to know each of your ages. Walcott would have been stunned if he'd known it was 500 million years. All the same, he was fascinated with this, and as the world's leading expert in Cambrian fossils, he decided to come out here. The Cambrian has always been particularly important to paleontologists because for a very long time, it was thought that the beginning of the Cambrian was the beginning of life on the planet. 
The reason for this is simple. In England, where geology was first invented, discovered, whatever you want to call it, in England, as in anywhere else in the world, you walk along the rocks and they get younger as you go through them. And you go through these huge, immense bunches of rock with no life in it, the pre-Cambrian. And then you get to a divide and suddenly at Cambrian time, the, fo the rocks start to have all sorts of fossils. So it made, made a world of sense that, that's what, that they would think that life began in the Cambrian. Anyway, Walcott, after reading McConnell's paper, he decided he had to come out here. He wanted to see it for himself. So he came up this very same trail that we're on today, about 112 years ago, went up to where we're going today, and spent the summer of 1909 with his family, splitting rocks and collecting them and putting them in boxes and putting them on horses and taking them down to the train and sending them back to Washington, D.C. He collected some eight to 10,000 specimens that first summer. At the end of the summer, Walcott decided to treat his family because, you know, he'd made them sit in the hot sun splitting rocks all summer. Do your parents ever make you do that? Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. I don't even think we're allowed to let prisoners do that anymore, right? Split rocks in the hot sun. Mm. Anyway, he took them on a little vacation and they were over in that valley there. This treed ridge in the foreground is called Burgess Pass and just behind Burgess Pass there's a trail. And him and his family were riding on horseback down at, uh, uh, in between Wapta, Mount Wapta in the distance and Mount Field in the foreground. And they came across a slab of rock. It was probably not much different than any of these slabs you see here except it had these trilobites on it, but it also had fossils that he'd never seen before. Fossils like this. You see, the difference between a trilobite and a soft-bodied animal is when you run your thumbs on the trilobites, they have bumps, they have ridges. That's because they had a, a bit of a shell. But the soft-bodied animals they just get squished completely, so they look like a film, right? Pass this around. Don't put these on the ground, because I'll lose them. Just pass them to another human. Oh, Walcott would spend the next 16 years. Do you see it? What does it look like to you, Andres? Looks like a, I don't know the name in English. Like a, the, the guys that uh, suck blood out of you. Oh, like, like a leech. Leech. Leech, but with legs. <laughs> Some people think it looks like a shrimp. Yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. But less curl. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, its name is Anomalocaris, which means strange shrimp in from the Latin. Mm. Walcott would collect 75,000 specimens over the next 15 or 16 years, put them in wooden boxes and send them back to this... So, how is this possible, like, to find one here and another here? Like, how does this work? Like, it's pretty cool. It talks about the density, about how many fossils are at this location. But also different age? A little bit. Because, like, to put, like, this guy died in one time and this one died in another? Or, like... <laughs> so, the whole succession, the, here, the fossil succession here, the depth of it is about 1.6 meters. I'm about 1.9 meters, so it's a little bit less than my, my height. Uh, that's where the fossils are. And the age from the bottom to the top is probably on the order of 250,000, maybe 500,000 years. So yes, they're of different ages, but when you're talking about 500 million years, you know, it's like rounding, right? Like, it's not that much different. It's like if you have two twins and one comes out before the other one, yeah, technically yeah. older, but who Close. cares, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Close enough. Mm -hmm. Walcott knew he was on to Put something pretty speaker. exciting. Huh? Put them in the speaker, and he Let me see. You see, you see us again. You see one. wrote a bunch of papers that had enormous impact, that were really important in the early part of the 20th century. People's imaginations were captured 
Delicious. by these incredible animals that were coming out of the Burgess Shale. Uh, Jordan, come here for a second. Santi, trae las maletas para los platos. Plato, plato. Plato, déjeme esta, déjeme esta. Y la otra también. This is what the first life. No sé con cuidado, Pipe. In the Cambrian looked like, and as you can see, these are some pretty weird and wacky creatures. Those are all life size. The one you have in your hand, Rosie, is called Opabinia. We will not see that today. There are only about five or six of those in the world. So but beautiful. So beautiful. The one in your right hand looks like a trilobite, but it's not Andreas. And the other one is a preapolid worm that are fairly common. But I brought it out because it's entirely a worm. It has no hard parts, no shells, no nothing. And yet these things are beautifully preserved in the Burgess Shale. It's Wow, so Popular science magazines in the 1920s got Pásenme very excited about acá. this. It was a Pásenme big part of popular culture. Las dos. People were thrilled and excited to see these weird and wonderful animals that were essentially thought to be our ancestors, the earliest animal life. It wouldn't be until 50 years later into the 1960s when the Canadian government decided to make a collection for ourselves because of course the Americans had taken them all. Familiar story, right? Yeah. In the mid-1960s, the Canadian government uh, hired Simon Conway, or Harry Whittington and some of his graduate students, most notably Simon Conway Morris and Derek Wiggs, to make a collection for our centennial. Canada was 100 in 1967. And we wanted to, as one of the projects, to create a collection of Burgess Shale animals for Canada. Unfortunately, they did a really bad job of collecting fossils. But what they did do was re-examine the fossils no, that Walcott had worked with and came up with some new conclusions. They felt that you see, by this time they knew the actual ages of these things, not that that mattered a great deal, but they also knew something really important, and that was that while these fossils represent the beginning of animal life as we know it, they certainly weren't the beginning of life on the planet, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. In the 1980s, a guy by the name of Desmond Collins from the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto came out here and started collecting and over 27 seasons he would collect 150,000 specimens from here and from across the road at Walcott's Quarry. In the late 80s there were more discoveries made around the world, most notably in southern China at a place called uh, Shenzhen in Yunnan province. I mean, see, the funny thing is, this was enormously important scientifically, the discovery of the Burgess Shell, but also enormously important culturally. People loved this, but the problem from a scientific point of view is there was only one site. Imagine for a minute that the five of us were fossilized right here, and in 50 million years, paleontologists of the future dug up our fossils, but that was all they had from that time period, from this time period, right? Mm -hmm. They would be totally correct in saying that in the year 2021, the earth was populated by guided hiking groups, conifer trees, and mosquitoes, because that's all they had. Mm -hmm. Now we know sitting here that the world's a lot more complicated than that, but that was the fear with the Burgess Shale because it was a very small area and was it representative? Was it telling you anything about what life was really like? Or was it simply an anomaly or some strange place? That's really cool. Uh, Santiago has found a, uh, one of the soft ones, the anomalocars. 
Nice find, buddy. Mm. Thank you. No, no, uh, the one I, I, I really like, I'm um, interested, is uh, Alucigenia. Alucigenia? It's not found here, right? It's not found yeah. here. And we it's... don't have any on the other side. As cool as it is, it's fairly rare. They found them over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. But they don't, we don't, when we take clients up there, they don't actually get to see them because they're not there. Mm. And they're really, really small. When you see the pictures of hallucinogenia, you think, oh, big guy. But typically in life, they're only about that big. Wow. I wonder what this one is. What do you think it is? It's a part of a trilobite. In 1989, then, in southern China, they found another site which allowed them to say, well, the animals of the Burgess Shale existed all over the world, and they were representative. It wasn't just some sort of anomaly that occurred only here. More sites have been found since. There is another site that was discovered in 2012 in the park over Marble Canyon by uh, Stanley Glacier. And there's a new site in China called Qingjiang, which we're just starting to hear about, but it could be very cool as well. Now I stood here in this very spot 28 years ago to start to recount the story of the history of life on Earth. And I would have said three things. Yo. What do you think that is? Hello? It's a trilobite. <laughs> what part of the trilobite? Uh, the no. wings? The head. the head. Something we got to remember. At the time that we're talking about today, everything that's alive lives in the ocean. There is no life on land. There is no life in the air. Everything is exclusively marine. Can you catch this? I don't want to put your eye up. Nice catch. I would have said three things. We don't know how or where life began. We don't know when life began. But however it happened, it must have been extremely difficult and extremely unlikely. 28 years later, I'm standing here, I'm going to say, we have a pretty good idea of where and when life began. And not only was it not that difficult, it probably happened over and over and over again. Scientists now believe that life began in the very deepest part of the ocean, around those... Uh, Jordan, don't kill stuff. That's okay. I was trying to sting you. I did this. I know. It's not going to sting you now. Okay, you can put it out of its misery. Okay. I know. Okay. Life probably began at, do you know what a deep sea hydrothermal vent is, Santiago? Yes. Life probably began there. Immense pressures, high temperatures, and that's where life Sing probably began. Single Abra, 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 abra. Out of fear. Yeah, okay. No, 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 was probably not that hard. It probably started about somewhere on the order of four billion years ago. Remember that at the time of Walcott and these discoveries, they thought life was beginning in the Cambrian or about 500 million years old. We now know that it's many, many times older than that. But as Santiago just said so clearly, life for the first three and a half billion years is single cell. And if you had come here, you wouldn't have been able to see it. What the Cambrian marks and what the Burgess Shale tells the story of is the second real group of organisms that you could see with the naked eye that are multicellular and macroscopic. Venga, filmenlo ahí. 
for that yeah, first thing. three and a half billion years, you might be inclined to think, eh, not much happens because we're solely focused on what we're all about, right? But there were some pretty significant evolutionary developments. Things like photosynthesis. Turns out today about 99 point some odd nines of all life on Earth gets its food at some point from yep. photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is brilliant, but still only single cell. The second development that's absolutely required to create complex life like me, you, the trees, and the fungus is the, is the evolution of eukaryotic cells. You see, early life was just like a Ziploc full of jello, a prokaryotic cell like a bacteria or a cyanophyte. Complex life requires a cell with a, with a membrane-contained nucleus and little organelles and all those sorts of things. It wouldn't be until about 650 million years ago, still an immense amount of time, but we've already had, you know, 350 million years of life, when large macroscopic life would have been seen. This is another toy, but it's a model of a group of life, of fossils, that comes from about 650 to about 545 million years ago. This is an example of one of the organisms from the Ediacaran. This is called Charnia discus. And while it might look at first like a plant, it's not. It's found in water much deeper, so it's dark down there. And unlike animals that we see in the Burgess Shale and subsequent to that, it's not, it doesn't have the same internal setup or architecture as an animal. All of the animals we usually think about have a mouth, a gut, and a butt. They have this hollow tube-like structure or architecture. These guys did not. They just hung out waiting for food to come to them. It'd be a bit like me cramming a cheeseburger into your chest, Jordan. That got your attention, didn't it? Yeah. How's lunch? It looks good. Yeah. Do you want? No, no. Um, at the end of the period of time that the Ediacaran fauna lived, this is part of Ediacara, as I said. The earth got very cold. It was a massive ice age. So much worse than the ice age that we have recently experienced. It's a real much of You can do it, Jordan. Póngalo así y coma rápido. You can do it. No, a mí no me haga así. What if he puts the plate on that stump up there or yeah. something? Come that ya, work? porque si no, no le voy a dar pan. Lo soluciona y, y, y sol for yourself. Ah, ahí está. Ok. Ahí, de él. Póngase acá, arrímese ahí. No importa si se cae, da, da ese mar. Ahí, de él, de él. Uh-oh. Oh. 